I'm going to ask you to come down, maybe sit in here for the Q&A. We have 20 minutes for questions, and I'm sure you have many. I'm going to ask you to try to be as brief as possible. And introduce yourself. Oh, Hernando Zuleta from Universidad de los Andes. Uh, just one short question for, for Noam. So you just show us that there is a uh, pr big preference for um, redistribution, but I'm not familiar with this literature, so maybe the, the, um, it's, it's obvious the answer, but do you have or do we know about preferences for taxation? It's related to one thing that Santiago Levy said yesterday. That in order to have redistribution, we need taxation, and it seems to me that we don't want taxes. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. The one who's writing, yes, hi. Oh, no. Uh, no problem, I can't see it from here. But in any case, uh, could, do you have a theory for why it is that the uh, legislators are to the right of the uh, top 20%? Uh, One more question. So this is for uh, Leopoldo. Um, political include so the narrative is, d despite political inclusion and major economic advances, you know, is major economic advances in Latin America. I mean, if, if by comparison to Asia and everywhere else, you know, there are all these graphs of, uh, you know, how Latin America started over here, everybody else overtook us. You know, there's only Africa below us now. Um, so I wanted you, to, you know, to comment on that. All right, why don't we go first round of answers? I don't know who wants to start. Do you want to start? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I guess what your benchmark is, and I think you're completely right that we talk about the success of Latin America relative to uh, perhaps uh, some benchmark, and we're doing relatively well, but uh, if we think about like, uh, and that's not new, right? If you think about 19th century Latin America, our reference should be the US, so we did very poorly. Uh, whereas if you take perhaps other reference, we're not doing as bad. Um, but I agree with you, and I was trying to sell the glass half full uh, kind of story in the sense that uh, it's not that things have been still in terms of, uh, of economic progress. And I do think that some countries, and in particular the context that I was showing, Colombia does have some, some things to show in terms of reduction in poverty rates, increase in life expectancy, uh, increase in coverage in you know health provision to its population. So there are all shades of grays and blacks and everything in this. Uh, but I, I just w didn't want to be completely unfair with respect to, you know, everything has been still since. Uh, but I agree with you, and actually my benchmark is that we should be uh, aiming higher and we should think of ourselves as, as falling far behind from where we should be. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thanks uh, for, for both those comments um, or questions. So uh, I don't think we have great data on, on preferences for taxation in the sense that, um, or preferences for redistribution, honestly. I mean, these, these questions are quite vague. Um, uh, I think where there are slightly more detailed questions about taxation on whom and for what purpose, uh, taxation on the sort of top of the income distribution in order to redistribute to the bottom of the income distribution are quite popular. But, but you have to ask these questions in a way that sort of suggests what's actually going to happen is, is something to do with uh, redistribution. Um, uh, and, and there, there wasn't, I think it was, there was another paper in the, in the program on, uh, uh, right, the sort of experiments on sort of um, uh, expectations about uh, you know whether the state is going to actually sort of do these things and and things like that so this is also a problem with sort of asking the question of preferences for redistribution because it's sort of contingent on whether you think the state will actually do the things they actually redistribute rather than you know corruption sort of taking uh, the resources and and things like that but I I don't think um, uh, I don't think that if you looked at sort of these responses in Southern Europe, for instance, that that would be very different. Uh, whereas, you know, they do have higher levels of redistribution even in, um, in Southern Europe. Um, uh, why the elites are to the right of the top 20%, so I don't know. Uh, but um, one 
possible explanation, was, which is consistent with sort of um, what uh, Marty Gillins and other people have found in the US, is that the, um, what those elites are actually sort of the preferences those elites are actually responding to are um, much narrower than the top 20%. They're the top 5% or the top 1%. And so to the extent you think those preferences are moving to the right, then, then that would be consistent with that. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question for uh, Marian Mariano. OK, uh, well, it was all. Uh, I took like the information from Mariano in Pinci, I, I think it is. Pin what was it? Sorry, I didn't remember your name. Ah, Pilar. Pilar, Pilar and Noam. And what was common in all of your presentation was that Peru had one of the worst indicators in almost everything. <laughs> yeah, per in, in Peru you saw, uh, as Pilar showed, that the, the public schools, when you start increasing your, in your income, you move to the to private schools because they are clearly better. In Peru, that's clear, clear. Uh, I, I live in there, I did my undergraduate course there, and I know that for a fact, and he's Peruvian, he can confirm that information. Uh, and I, th I think you, uh, ah, and Maria, Mariano, all, you, you, you show us that in Peru there was like little uh, preference for redistribution. I think it was the worst in the country with, with preference for redistribution. And my question is for Mariano, because you show it that uh, two for three matrix where you put some kind of equilibrium, right? So in my opinion, Peru is, is located in the equilibrium where you have a, like when the rich and the middle income families, like they join and they left out the poorest of the population and they are not taken into consideration for anything. And that's my opinion of, of Peru, uh, I, uh, well, for what, I, for what I seen. So I don't know if you know for, uh, of any cases, any examples from countries where there, where, which were there, like stagnated in that position, but they did something that could change like the path of the country in order to get a better situation. Because it's not, uh, they, for, for example, in this moment they have a left president, and what I have listened from my Peruvian friends is that thanks to that, to that president, uh, at least in, tw in 20 years there, will, there won't be any other left president because he's not the best, he's not the best. So I don't know if you, ha if you know of cases where they have uh, turned out to uh, change that, that path of, of development. Any other question or comment? I, I, I have a question for, 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 for what you already r raised, which is this tension between the two approaches that you are uh, presenting. And I was wondering whether that tension uh, truly exists from coming from different frameworks, and whether we need Mariano to enlarge his framework to actually be able to <laughs> help us rationalize these two views, or whether there are situations in which weak parties can still provide a new, fresh perspective with more redistribution, and I, I, I want you to reflect on under what circumstances you think this uh, may happen. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Julian, and again, a pleasure to, to be here and part of this conversation. The question is very difficult, so I'm not going to answer it, but I, I'm going to say a, a few things related to that. W one are very small things from my little model, then more important things relating to the later questions, to your later questions. Um, in this little model, I only have rich and poor, you know, modest version with two groups. Uh, in that case, what you described at the Peru data point will fit the equilibrium that I, that give me small taxation, small redistribution and inefficient state. So that Peru what kind of fits in there in our data set. Of course, this is an extreme simplification and other papers. I have two authors to my left who have worked on that. Once you include middle class, other things would happen and there are very nice papers showing that there are some conditions under which the middle class naturally ally with the rich 
And in those cases, those equilibria predict you have little taxation, because that's what the rich want. You have some redistribution, but redistribution benefits mostly the middle class and doesn't get to reach the poor. That's a bit the story of many of our countries in some points in our history, the truncated welfare states, etc. So that's uh, observation number one. The second observation is a deeper point that was also to some extent common to the two questions. Um, one thing is, in this humble model, we try to explain equilibria, and that is very hard in itself. Then explaining transitions is very complicated theoretically, and, and identifying which theories are in practice is even harder. And so that, perhaps th going that way would be the way I suggest we should answer your some of your question and your later question. How do we move to one equilibrium to another? It's quite natural in the history of humanity, and Daron has been a great contributor to our understanding of that, that we are moving to on average, we're moving, obviously, to more inclusive society, to a more inclusive state. They will focus on a particular democratic transition. Now we're going, uh, uh, Argentina underwent a second incorporation, and some people have worked on that. And in this incorporation, and the Colombian change in the constitution was part of that game. And as many people have studied, some of us focus on institutionalization, parties, the standard thing that works in the steady state. Obviously, we want to get there, but sometimes to get there, we have to try to incorporate the other people, and perhaps that's the tension we're seeing among those two, two stories. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I guess the w one thing um, I would say that is, is related to this that sort of um, struck me, Leopoldo, this time that I hadn't seen last time uh, when you presented the emergence of new parties, almost all of them are indigenous parties. So the, the sort of the color that emerges as sort of the biggest. So, so, so the literature that I'm drawing on would say um, class-based parties is what's going to get you. So that's the European model. Ethnic parties are not going to do that, right? So if 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 what you're considering inclusion is sort of encompassing both sort of marginalized class groups and marginalized ethnic groups, then you know you might be sort of including two different things that that sort of the, the literature on parties would not, I think, believe has the same effects. And so if, if the inclusion that we're seeing in Colombia is, is, is sort of ethnic minorities, um, then you, know, you might not expect economic outcomes to be different. I, I don't know if that's the, uh, the, the story, but, um, but I do think, I, I do agree with Mariano that there's, a, there's an element of sort of um, change will you know, sort of include some time of some you know, period of time of instability, um, at, you know, and maybe we're at, at the point where the equilibria are sort of shifting and we don't know uh, which way we're going. Um, but, but I guess to that I would say that the experience of, you know, sort of social democratic parties emerging in Western Europe uh, was a period of, of, of sort of change, but had kind of the, um, the prior sort of the, the ability to mobilize sort of social movements. And one feature of the region in the last 20 or 30 years is not the emergence of uh, sort of new parties on the basis of sort of large social movements, but new parties because the existing parties kind of, you know, fell apart. And, uh, and new parties that are simply electoral vehicles, right? The kinds of things we see in Peru. I mean, Peru has sort of new parties at every election because the same people run for election under a new party label uh, with you know, some sort of new coalition, but not really because there's a, a social movement uh, sort of behind those parties. So maybe that's you know, one of the, the big differences between the, the trend in, in Latin America and the, the kind of emergence that we see in other cases. So uh, I, w I was thinking, and differently, uh, but as you spoke, I think that it really relates to what just uh, what you two just said, which is, I think context matters a lot, and we're looking at a context in which, when we had so, when, we, when we had sort of a strong parties in Colombia, the liberal and conservative, they, they were they were strong, but they weren't able to represent large cross sections of the society. So of course, all else equal, I also want strong parties, and I also think that if you build strong parties that are able themselves to put together diverse but somehow coherent different views, then those are more likely going to say, uh, kind of reach agreements, 
are more likely to reduce uncertainty, are more likely to have broad-based redistribution. I fully agree with that. But the context of Colombia is one in which these strong parties were not representing large swaths of the population. And the form of political entry, and so this re relates very much to what Mariano said, was initially a form of political entry in which, you know, out of these two parties, outside of these two parties, other groups that were not represented by them started entering. Actually, they started entering so much in so small parties that nobody liked it, and, and we did this 2003 reform, and we fixed that to some extent, but it is still the case that Colombia has not produced two or three or four large parties that within themselves can, able, can, can have diverse but nonetheless coherent kind of different views. So in that sense, when we show this data for Colombia, what we really have in mind is not oh, now we have weak parties and that's kind of good because, no, what, of course, <laughs> what we have in mind is, well, that's a sign of how political entry occurred. Now, had it occurred be inside the liberal and the conservative parties, uh, then, yeah, perhaps much better, but that's something that didn't happen. Um, so, and that connects to what you were saying, which is these groups that were entering were, yes, in one of the graphs, majority indigenous, but when you look at who then got to power, then Indigenous were important, black groups were important, women were important, former guerrilla groups were important. So these are all groups that didn't have access to formal political power. They w just distrust this exclusive political party so much that it's only reasonable that they didn't do it within the strong political party system. Uh, so in that sense, I think that, uh, you know, if I abstract myself from the Colombian context and if I just look at whether strong or weak parties are better, then of course I'm going to agree with you and I'm going to agree with the reduction of uncertainty, broad best redistribution and so forth. But we were not so much aiming at looking at the effect of a strong versus weak parties, but as a measure of the extent of fluidity in political uh, power and competition and contestation, which even in a strong party system you want to see. You want to see that, uh, to see, if you see a very entrenched uh, political power, you won't see broad-based distribution, you would see uh, some fraction of the elite uh, or some fraction of the party controlling the party and staying in power and so forth. So that's an attempt at reconciling these views, but I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting tension, the, the one that has uh, arised in, in, uh, with, with our two papers. So, so this is just, you know, uh, on the spot thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You want to have it, Just one last word, because I really also like the, the two interventions, and I still am passed you know, by your deep question about how can we think transitions for, in your example, cases like Peru towards a better, more inclusive, yet more cohesive and institutionalized equilibrium. And I just, I don't have the answer, but I look here at my famous friends who have power to organize things. So I think we should organize to think better about this. <laughs> The notion, again, the notion of equilibria is useful to think about approximation to steady states, but many of our countries are in transitions. And I think your paper is a very nice description of the current state of the Colombian transition. If I have to throw one example, but every country example will have somebody upset, I think Uruguay did a bit of a job of there were two parties and then a third one entered on the left and they kind of accommodated and they live in a rather civilized manner so we have to look for examples and my fear coming from Argentina is that in some of the cases the incorporation period makes you jump from elite domination to populism none, none of which is a good equilibrium for welfare or for the poor for that matter thank you we have one last pressing question just more than a question, it's a, it's a suggestion for Pilar for future research, and thank you very much for your presentation, I really liked it. Uh, at the moment, what happened with, with COVID is that a lot of these private schools for the low-income deciles were closed because they were bankrupt. So I think it's a very nice opportunity to understand, uh, thinking about what you were of your paper, to think what implications would that have and what implications is having right now. Uh, all these school closures. And what we're seeing is a lot of people migrating to public schools. And pu uh, public schools completely overflowed in many countries. So I think that's an interesting opportunity for future research, thinking on what you're doing right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Thank you, thank you very much, everybody. Before you all go, I will just take 30 seconds to uh, basically draw your attention on this website. All of the papers that you've seen here discussed are going to start popping up on this website. There is very little yet in there, but there is something useful, which is you can follow us. You go there, you put your email address, and then you will get emails with a lot of interesting stuff that is going to be coming in the next few months. And maybe some of the things that you are doing, please bring into us so that we can actually be aware. I mean, this conference has been great for that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great.